in a nutshell, that's the Article 10 process. There's a, uh, there are ways for you to get additional information about the Article 10 process. If you wish, feel free to come up to me at any point or ask Joe at the back, back desk how you can get more information. Um, we can, we, again, we can act as resources in terms of pointing, pointing you to where you can get information. Obviously, as judges, we don't want to get involved with any individual about the merits of the proposal because at this point it's important that all of the parties be privy or that they have knowledge of all of the comments that are made to the decision makers, meaning Judge O'Connell and myself, and, and the ad hocs for that matter. So uh, we can't entertain any arguments. You can't come up to us and tell us what you think, what your concerns are, unless it's in a public forum on the record. One on one, it's called ex parte and, and it's prohibited. All right? Everybody clear on that? Any questions at all? Okay. Thanks again for coming, sir. Uh, I was just wondering is this, uh, <coughs> this comment period and everything, is that uh, considered uh, uh, as far as the deciding board's decision to continue the project? Um, is, could it still be held up or stopped or? Or is it too late for that? Or I mean, I don't. Okay. So the question is, uh, is it is given this comment period on the application, is it is it too late to slow down or stop the project? And the answer to that is, it's not too late to do anything with respect to the application because the siting board hasn't taken any action yet. That's what I was understanding, but yes. I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Yes, that's correct. Right now, we're still developing the record. And uh, we're not yet at the position of developing recommendations for siting board action, and we're not yet at the point when the siting board starts to look at the record and consider the recommendations and render a decision. So uh, the comments that are offered at the public statement hearing today uh, are going to be part of the record. We're going to have a court reporter, and I, I make it a point to try and read all the comments and all the cases I'm assigned to. Uh, and if people raise specific questions that I can answer, I try and get back to them. Uh, I can assure you that we do read the comments. And I, based on conversations with Chairman Rhodes and, and uh, ad hoc members that I've talked to in, in other cases, <coughs> the siting board members do pay attention to public comment. It the, does. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The uh, statements and comments made today, will they be posted on the DPS website? The, uh, Along with the ones that already are, the public statement hearing will be posted. What what's hap What's going to happen is the court reporter is going to show up in time for the 3 p.m. public statement hearing to record all the comments that are made, and uh, barring any technical difficulties with the recording, which I haven't run into, I've had pretty good experience with that. I'm kind of plastic. Um, closer. Okay. Um, yeah, it'll be recorded and a transcript will be published and become part of the record. Sir, the, with a ra hand raised in the back of the room. Uh, will the speakers, I see you have a wireless mic there. When the speaker is allowed to speak, will they be given a wireless mic? Yes, during the public statement hearing, I'm going to hand the <laughs> microphone off to the speakers so that. Uh, and you're saying you're also recording all audio. Well, this part isn't recorded. The public statement hearing will be will be recorded. The information forum is an informal meeting, <coughs> question and answer period. So, we're not going to have a trend. Right now, we're not quote unquote on the record. Thank you. Yep, sir. How about uh, statements that are submitted in writing? Questions. Statements submitted in writing are given equal weight, and some people prefer to submit statements in writing because it gives them a chance to think through their thoughts and express them perhaps more clearly. Uh, but they're, they are, uh, I, like I said, I go through all the comments that are posted on the website. And if there are written comments that are filed in, in the proceeding, the judges are going to look at those as well. And they do become part of the record. So the, the form of, of your comments does not, really doesn't matter. What matters is if you offer comments. Okay. Any other any other questions about the Article 10 process? Okay. Um, then I'm going to pass it off to uh, company representative. 
Yep. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Liberman. I'm a project manager with the firm Environmental Design and Research. Uh, we were one of the lead environmental consultants in developing the Article 10 application for the Bluestone Wind Project. I'm here also with representatives from Bluestone Wind. We have uh, Alec Jarvis, uh, we have uh, Bill Whitlock, and in the back we have Valeria Turan and Jill Van Dalen. So I'll give a little bit of an overview. Uh, <coughs> so I'll walk through, hopefully everybody can hear me, hopefully everybody can see the screen. Uh, we'll walk through a, a little bit of a 10,000 foot overview of the project, and then we'll talk a little bit more specifically about some of the components within the Article 10 application. Uh, and then we'll open it up for uh, some questions and answer. So we'll hit a little bit about the Article 10. We're going to talk about the project layout. We'll provide some information on uh, project specifics. We'll talk through some of the environmental analyses that have been performed, both natural and cultural resources. We'll talk a little bit about some of the visualization. There's a simulation here on this side of the room. And also just want to make folks available. I know the room's tight, but there are several maps throughout the room that if, it, if we do get a chance to break up, there's a lot of... Uh, oversized prints that we can look at to kind of do a deep dive if we have to. And then we'll go into the Q&A. So with respect to project layout, oh, I'm sorry, uh, just to kind of reiterate, the application was filed on September 18th, deemed compliant on uh, December 27th. Uh, the application is actually sitting right here. Uh, that is uh, six-sevenths of the application document. There's another uh, uh, binder on the other side of the table. Uh, it comprised of 41 exhibits. Uh, and I think we were at Appendix PPP, support studies, supporting reports, uh, support drawings, all in, um, all in order to be deemed compliant with the Article 10 requirements. So we'll start with the general project location. Uh, and I apologize for folks the size of the screen, but like I said, we do have maps throughout the room. For context, this is Interstate 86, New York State Route 17. This is New York State Route 41, town of Sanford. The town of Windsor. As you'll see, the project splits both towns. Uh, the majority of the project is in the town of Sanford with portions here in Windsor. So as many of you may know, and for them, some of you that may not, the project is comprised of up to 33 wind turbines generating up to 124 megawatts of electricity. 29 turbines are in the town of Sanford, four turbines are in the town of Windsor. Together with the turbines, the project also consists of uh, access roads for construction and operation, uh, two permanent meteorological towers so that weather data, wind data can be collected and calibrated with the project. It includes a collection and a point of interconnection substation, which is where all of the electric generation from the wind turbines will be collected at a collection substation and trans transferred to a point of interconnection substation at the existing 115 kilovolt Aftonville, Afton to Stylesville transmission line. At the collection substation, there will be a small battery storage component so that uh, electricity can be stored at the collection substation. There will be a temporary laydown area in various staging yards to facilitate construction. And there will be an operation and maintenance uh, building situated off of William Law Road. This graphic here gets into a little bit more of the specifics. So if for those that can see, the orange dots and this is a graphic that you can see right behind you folks on that wall as well. The orange circles represent the turbine sites. The dotted orange lines represent the collection line. All of it, the electricity that's generated at the wind turbines will be transmitted to a collection substation. For point of reference in the northeast corner, that's where the collection and the point of interconnection substation will be proposed because the existing 115 kilovolt transmission line is located there. The, oh, sorry, Dan, just go back real quick. Centrally located in the, generally almost in the middle of the project, is what's referred to as the operation and maintenance yard. That's where the primary laydown area will be during construction. That's where uh, a permanent operations and maintenance building will be proposed. That's situated right here. So, with some specifics to the application, there are 41 exhibits, and I think many of you here are probably interested in 10 or 12. Uh, and so we're going to try to hit some of the highlights here uh, and get a little bit more information um, so that we can have a pretty productive Q&A session. The preliminary design drawings that we're talking about now refer to what's, co what's called Exhibit 11. Article 10 requires that preliminary design drawings of the plans be included with the application. So there are essentially 
or roughly, there are three sets of drawings that were provided with uh, the application. They were prepared by licensed professionals in New York State. In fact, uh, Hulbert Engineering and Survey helped out with the surveying work for some of the civil design in preparation of what's called the preliminary civil design drawings. There are preliminary electrical design drawings and preliminary foundation drawings in support of Exhibit 11. The thing that I think is probably most uh, notable here for this group for today is with respect to the civil engineering drawings, uh, they show the entire facility, all of the access roads, all of the collection lines, all of the turbine locations with two foot contours. They show where the proposed grading will be. They show where the proposed work will be. And so from that, having that level of detail in the application allows us to go through and make detailed environmental impact assessments of various uh, topics. So that information is shown on the civil design drawings. In addition, it also shows the erosion and sediment controls required to be compliant with the New York State DEC regulations. In this case, it'll be the New York State DEC uh, Stormwater Management Design Manual and what's commonly referred to as the Blue Book, which is the standards and specifications for erosion sediment control. Uh, they're shown on the preliminary civil engineering drawings to satisfy coverage under the New York State Speedies Permit. In addition, we also show where the construction operations will occur, where the limit of work will be, where the limit of clearing will be. That's all documented on the on the preliminary civil drawings. And one thing just to note here, uh, the Bluestone Wind is continually in discussions with local utilities, including NYSEG and the, some of the gas line owners, to make sure that required standards and specifications and design standards are being met and presented in the appropriate drawings. Noise and vibration relates to exhibits 15 and 19. Uh, they have to do with public safety and noise. And so there's two sets of background data that are kind of critical to the establishment of uh, this type of noise uh, impact assessment. There's ambient baseline surveys, which were conducted in, at the facility site two times a year per the Article 10 regulations. There was summer monitoring and there was winter monitoring. In addition to that data set, uh, there was a, a, a detailed inventory of potential sensitive receptors performed within one mile of turbine components. Receptors could be houses, uh, commercial facilities. They were defined based on the New York State Office of Real Property Tax Code as agreed to in the stipulations by the parties to the project. Those sensitive receptors and using the ambient baseline surveys, a noise consultant, uh, Epsilon Associates, prepared what's called a noise impact assessment or, or uh, a pre-construction noise impact assessment. And what that assessment showed is that no sensitive sound receptor uh, will exceed 45 dBA and no participating receptor will, rec will exceed 55 dBA, which is compliant with uh, the Article 10 guidelines. The, the, that's a great question, and if, if we want to go the, the QA, while I'm talking, I'm certainly open to answering these questions as we go. The various wind turbine manufacturers have data, it's called sound power, sound, sound power output data. That data is used to extrapolate um, and model what the potential impacts would be, which is very similar to how other noise modeling goes. If you want to model uh, whether it's, a, you know, whatever type of land use it is, there are um, data sets out there that can be used to develop the model. But I think what's important to note is it was modeled against ambient conditions, which were, which were measured both in summer and in winter, specific to this facility site. So, yeah, nice, thank you. Uh, another topic uh, is related to Exhibit 20. It has to do with cultural resources. Uh, this is archaeology, properties that are on the National Register, uh, the nationally registered listed properties. And so uh, the firm at EDR has a registered archaeologist on staff, and we prepared uh, two different cultural resources work plans for review and approval by the State Historic Preservation Office. They include an archaeological work plan for looking at uh, archaeological artifacts under the ground, and it also included a historic resources effects analysis work plan, which looked at architecture, historic architecture, historic sites, etc. Based on those approved work plans from the State Historic Preservation Office, a pretty intensive field effort was undertaken in the spring of 2018. Uh, there were archaeological shovel tests dug, there were uh, historic architectural reconnaissance uh, performed, and in fact, uh, the Bluestone Wind actually worked with the SUNY 
uh, Binghamton Public Archaeological Facility. They actually have a group, I don't know if you, many of you know this, in, uh, at SUNY Binghamton that focuses on archaeology and cultural resources. So they played a critical role at performing much of the field investigations with respect to archaeologically, which resulted in a Phase 1B report that has since been submitted to the, to the State Historic Preservation Office and accepted. Um, and based on that detailed analysis, efforts were made by, the, by Bluestone Wind to actually shift various turbine components, to shift access roads, to shift collection lines, to avoid uh, state-sensitive archaeological resources, and also to avoid uh, the potential for any other uh, sensitive cultural resource site out there. Um, in fact, that, so in the Article 10 application under Exhibit 9, which focuses on alternatives, there's a pretty detailed discussion as to which steps were taken and when to avoid these impacts. For impacts that couldn't be avoided, there's also a cultural resources mitigation plan provided with the application that discusses some potential options for impacts to historic and, and visual impacts. With respect to Exhibit 21, uh, Site Soils and Geology, this was something that I, I think was a little different where on some prior Article 10 projects, the geological assessment was primarily desktop analysis. However, for this project, there were not only a desktop analysis performed, but there actually were <coughs> test borings using kind of a drill rig that you see here at a subset of the project sites to get a, a broad characterization, or a defined characterization, I should say, of the soil conditions and the geological conditions out at the site. Um, what that report showed is that this site is suitable for this type of development, and that once in operation, after construction, long-term impacts to, to geologic conditions are not anticipated. Exhibits 22 and 23 focus on uh, ecology, they focus on surface waters, uh, and so there were, I would say, the majority of support studies were actually in support of these two exhibits here. Um, I'll start discussing wetlands and streams. Uh, wetlands and streams were delineated out to 500 feet, or within a 500 foot radius of potential ground disturbances. So that's essentially a thousand foot corridor centered on where work may occur. And it was really twofold. The reason really for doing that was so that, we could, so that decisions could be made to further avoid wetland impacts. But once those wetlands were delineated, uh, what's called a jurisdictional determination visit uh, was held in late October of 2018. That's a meeting on site with representatives from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the New York State DEC Region 7, where we walked the entire facility site, looked at various areas, looked at various wetland conditions so that the state and federal regulating agencies could either agree or disagree with the limits of wetlands as delineated. The delineations were conducted in accordance with U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and DEC guidance and design manuals, and there was concurrence at the jurisdictional determination visit in late October. Um, so the wetlands that have been delineated are used as the basis for this Article 10 application and any subsequent permitting moving forward. It's worth noting here that much like with cultural resources, uh, Bluestone Wind was able to avoid a lot of impacts and shift access roads and shift various components to avoid direct impacts to wetlands. Wetlands play a pretty critical role uh, here. So what I, what I show here and what's presented in the Article 10 application is there'll be temporary impacts to wetlands, wetlands that will be restored. We're going to, perhaps a collection line goes through a wetland temporarily and it'll be put back to pre-original conditions, pre-existing grades and stabilized. Uh, there'll be less than two acres of temporary impact. And with respect to permanent impact, it's actually less than a half of an acre. And it's just worth noting that the, the Army Corps of Engineers will also have to issue a permit for this project for the wetland impacts. By staying under that half of an acre threshold, it's allowed to be permitted under what's called a nationwide permit, uh, which is essentially a general permit that the Army Corps, and Army Corps of Engineers issues for small wetland impacts. A, a half of an acre threshold is a pretty small threshold to hit. To hit. There was also an invasive species study performed uh, in the growing season last year. Biologists went out, walked the entire facility area to identify where the predominance of invasive species, uh, if present, would be. And for those of you that may not know, an invasive species uh, is a plant species that is very aggressive, not native to this area. Um, Japanese knotweed, Moro's honeysuckle, and there's a list that the New York State DEC says are species of concern in New York State, so those were primary the ones that were looked for. These two are on that list. 
areas that contained a predominance of invasive species were mapped and identified and documented. And then from that report, what's called an invasive species control plan was prepared. Essentially, the invasive species control plan outlines the various measures that um, bluestone wind will take during construction to avoid the spread of invasive species. There's a lot of state standards that the DEC has, and there are other various sources of, of outlining best management practices that are integrated into the invasive species control plan. And in fact, that will be updated later this summer just to reflect any changing conditions at the request of the DEC. There were a variety of studies also performed related to uh, avian and bats. Um, you know, there were breeding bird surveys, raptor surveys, eagle studies, uh, an avian risk assessment was performed, a cumulative effects analysis, a habitat fragmentation analysis, and ultimately a net conservation benefit plan was prepared. Um, based on this information, we anticipate that uh, risk to eagles is expected to be low. Uh, and this is based on several years of eagle study. Uh, facility construction is not expected to negatively impact bat foraging or roosting habitat. And in fact, the net conservation benefit plan, which has been developed in accordance with DEC inputs, uh, outlines a variety of mitigation measures that can be implemented for the project to result in what's a net conservation benefit for the species. Some of those may include different items to be implemented during operations, such as curtailment, which is essentially uh, curtailing the operation of the turbine at certain conditions to avoid potential impacts. <coughs> Exhibit 24 of the application focuses on the visualization, and there's a simulation here. Uh, there are some simulations in the application. And it, it, it didn't start at the simulations. There was a long process that underwent to assess visual impacts for this project. Uh, going back to, I think, early 2018, it might have been late 2017, uh, there was a substantial outreach effort performed um, to solicit information from local communities with respect to uh, sensitive sites. In other words, where, when you assess visual impacts, we, we look to assess it from a particular location. In other words, parks, areas that are highly, uh, that recreational areas. And so we use a lot of publicly available data sources to develop a list of sensitive sites, state parks, federal preserve areas, um, but we don't know everything. So there was a local outreach letter sent, I want to say it was early 2018, to municipal planning representatives in the area, to the state, uh, New York State Office of Parks, to the New York State Office of uh, State Historic Preservation Office, and, and others soliciting information on sensitive sites. We received comments back from, I think, six or seven entities that listed a variety of potentially sensitive sites for our consideration and our impact of visual impacts. That input was added to a matrix that looked at all these sites and then said, okay, now on this kind of robust list of sensitive sites, we need to pick some potential viewpoints from which we can develop simulations and start to assess the environmental impact. We send a second round of public outreach letters to the same visual outreach stakeholders, municipal planning representatives, state agencies, et cetera, and requested input on the potential viewpoints. We received comments back from, I think, three or four groups with suggested viewpoints. We actually added all of those viewpoints into the total tally. I think the VIA that was prepared, I think it has up to 19 different simulations. And based on what we found, we took the simulations and they were actually reviewed by a third party rating panel of licensed landscape architects in New York State. And they, based on the rating panel, they look at the different variations from existing conditions to the simulations and provide an assessment of potential visual impact. And what it showed for this project is that Visual impact varies, um, but overall the, the change in landscape and the contrast uh, is would be considered minimal to medium based on various settings. I'm sure most people here are probably interested in Exhibit 25 dealing with transportation. Uh, Blue, Bluestone Wind is in the process of developing and finalizing road use agreements with both the towns of Windsor and Sanford. Uh, the purpose of the road use agreements is to address the use and restoration of roads in conjunction with the delivery of turbine components. Uh, in addition, there was an evaluation done by a New York State professional engineer to look at the route and identify potential areas where there could be a concern and where there may be some impacts to traffic. Uh, no change to traffic operations are anticipated, uh, certainly after construction. There may be some minor delays during construction, but those can be mitigated for by implementing New York State DOT best management practices. 
uh, socioeconomic effects have been evaluated as part of the Article 10 application. There's a standalone socioeconomic report as an appendix to Exhibit 27. And the socioeconomic report was based on what's called a JEDI model. It's a jobs and economic development impact model that is prepared by an independent third party. It's essentially a, a very detailed, uh, laborious spreadsheet that you provide inputs using the JEDI model inputs and it provides uh, an estimate of the potential overall uh, effects. And what the JEDI model indicates is that for this project, there's the potential for up to 150 peak full-time jobs statewide at any given time during construction with an estimated value of 11.4 million. In addition, from an operational standpoint, it's estimated that there could be upwards of seven full-time jobs with an estimated 600,000 in earnings. And also, what things to be mindful here is there's also secondary benefits and in, in what resulting from so with respect to secondary employment which is restaurants hotels to facilitate the construction and operation of the facility upwards of 297 jobs associated with construction and upward of 17 jobs associated with operations so we think there's a pretty uh, str you know pretty positive socioeconomic benefit of a project like this um, and in addition to that the applicant is continuing to work through pilot agreements uh, with the local municipality. So there's a really an, a layered benefit uh, with respect to the socioeconomics of a project of this scale. The plan, the Article 10 application also includes what's called a site restoration and decommissioning plan. Many people will say, well, what will happen if the, the wind project becomes inoperable? And that's, a, a, certainly understand that question. So the Article 10 application actually includes a decommissioning plan. That plan provides uh, time frames, environmental performance standards, various actions that will have to be met and agreed upon by the applicant and the state and all the parties to the process to say what will happen if a project becomes inoperable. The applicant will provide up to 100% financial security to implement the restoration and decommissioning plan and essentially all above ground facility components would be removed and the below grade components will be removed up to four feet. So there's a plan outlined in the Article 10 application for how to decommission this project if needed. And I mentioned earlier the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers nationwide permit. There are other uh, permits that would be required for a project like this outside of Article 10. While Article 10 supplants a lot of the state permits, there's still some federal permits that will be required. I mentioned before the Army Corps of Engineers and a permit with them will be filed with, uh, within the next uh, few weeks. Um, there's also ongoing coordination with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and there's ongoing coordination with the Federal Aviation Administration for this project. I know many of you may be able to look at it and see it from here, but there, in addition to some of the topics we've hit today, kind of pick those because they generally are, I think, the ones that people are the most interested in. But there were a wide variety of studies ranging from uh, vegetation management plan, uh, site project-specific safety plans, including an emergency action plan, health and safety plan, site security plans, there's a, a fair bit of information that has been evaluated and prepared as part of this application. So I'm happy to um, happy to answer any questions. We can certainly pull from the, the Bluestone Wind team as well to uh, answer any questions that folks may have at this point in time. You wanna... I have a question. How so much... for the benefit of the crowd, can we make sure the <coughs> microphone gets to the person asking the question? I'm Joan Bovier. I live in the village of Windsor. I'm retired. How much does a wind turbine weigh? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. So, great question. Um, it really depends on which components we're talking about. Um, I think it's something we could provide. It, so it depends on the manufacturer, right? If it's a GE or Siemens machine. But, you know, so uh, we could answer the question in terms of how much of the blades, how much do they weigh? Now, you know, approximately uh, a blade is about 14,000 pounds. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm just speaking generically because, you know, the best way to answer that question would be to get the model make right, similar to a car, what uh, the GE machine or the Siemens machine, and then provide you with, you know, the specific weights. 
because certain uh, manufacturers have different number of towers depending on the height. So you're going to have an added, you know, you're going to have, some have four sections, some have five. Um, you know, the, the nacelle is, which is the generator, is the, the heaviest part, um, which can be upwards of, you know, 60 tons. So, you know, that's something we can, we can provide follow-up if you have a, uh, per the individual make and model. That'd probably be a, a, a better response for you. We don't happen to have another microphone, do we? I think that's the only one we got. Hi, my name is Bob Coughlin. Um, how are the wind windmills going to be lit? And are the MEP towers going to be lit? lit? And uh, um, those are the two. So that the FAA will issue for every structure that we file, um, anything over 200 feet has to uh, have, you have to do FAA filing. So they'll when we get our determinations of no hazard back from FAA, they'll indicate which um, which structures have lights. So not you know you could assume that not every single light or structure tower or permanent met tower will have uh, a light. Um, so that becomes your lighting plan. Uh, so it's really the FAA that is determining all, all of your structures that have you filed those individual locations for, which ones have to be lit. There are going to be towers that are under 200 feet. No, I, my, I said that anything over 200 feet tall requires an FAA permit. Right. Right. Some of them may not have to be lit. The FAA, so FAA determines which ones have to be lit. So some of some of these structures might be over, you know, Actually, all of the permanent met towers in the turbines will be. Um, so some of them won't be lit. It all depends on FAA's analysis of the location of each, you know, and looking at aircraft, uh, you know, the visual, um, the analysis. So we'll have lights associated with the operations and maintenance building, um, the substation location. Those two locations will have, um, you know, will have lighting and as well as the. Uh, at the base of the tower for the door, you know, at the, the door to enter into the, the base section of the tower, there'll be lighting there as well. Yeah. In that list of things that you had about other topics that you didn't discuss, I thought the health and safety might be an interesting topic sure. to discuss. Sure, well, not just your health and safety during construction of the past, but the health and safety of the people who live in the area. After you're done, Absolutely. So Exhibit 15 deals with public health and safety, and that's where we discussed earlier in the presentation the, the potential impacts of noise and vibration. Um, so that is a major component of that. In addition, there's a variety. Exhibit 15 has a, a fair bit of information with respect to um, the potential health effects or lack thereof associated with wind projects. So if there's any specific topic that we want to talk through, we're certainly happy to answer what we can. But staying on uh, the what we alluded to here with respect with respect to the emergency action plan, with respect to the health and safety plan and the site security plan, those plans were circulated to local first responders as well as circulated to the New York State Department of Homeland Security for input. So the information that's been included in the application has, has gone through uh, a local review. Um, so I think that there's a lot of things that we've put into the application that are take, trying to take this information into account. If there's any additional specifics questions that you may have, we're certainly happy to uh, engage. You mentioned the thing about sound, about noise. That there's a flicker problem too. So sh there was a shadow flicker report um, prepared in the Article 10 application, much like much like we did with the noise and much like we did with the visual. Um, the shadow flicker study looks at the rotational aspects of the turbines and it looks at the same sensitive receptors that we had looked at for the noise, so that we're able to kind of make an apples to apples comparison. Uh, the, the the shadow flicker study. Uh, looking at the thresholds of 30 hours per year, uh, found that the, the num number of receptors that may be impacted is very low, and there is a variety of mitigation measures that can be implemented to make sure that there are no uh, further impacts associated with flicker. Uh, understood. Understood. There. So there's the, we're in the process right now.
Can folks hear what he's saying? No? Can you give him the mic, please? This is my barn to scale to your wind turbines. This is my barn. Okay, I can't even see it. It looks like a fly speck on this map. And yours is practically abutting the, prop the mountain at the top of the back of my property. And I've got a lot of questions. I have so many questions I can just based upon what you've said today. First of all, we can talk about the nationwide permit. You said one half acre, but this is 33 turbines with connecting roads. Well, that, the nationwide permit shouldn't apply. Already I see that you've kind of cut a corner there. That should not be. You've got 33 separate sites, minimum, and the connecting roads. Let me, let me just interrupt. My permit, were I to be doing a remedial action project, which is what I do for a living, by the way, and I'll let you know, I'm all the environmental business. And we would, they would never let me get away with that. So let me just clarify. Because uh, I've had this happen in public statement hearings previously. Give him the mic. The, the reason why folks are here tonight primarily is to offer comments on the record. And, and I've run into this previously where uh, the question and answer period sort of spontaneously morphs into a comment period. And this is not in any way to, to diminish the comments that you're offering. It's really to underscore that the importance of recording them. So uh, I was at a hearing probably a month and a half ago, and somebody said, you know, i got to say all that over again. So I, I hear what you're saying, um, but I want you to do it when the court report is recording, if that's OK. So, and, and it's really just a question of procedure, that's all. So if you have discrete questions about the project, that's, this is our opportunity to raise those. And I, and I hope you filled out a card. <coughs> so, OK. All right, good. Thanks. <laughs> good. If, I could just, if I could just close out the nationwide permit discussion for a minute. Um, we're, we're, I, I tend to disagree with, what, with your supposition. We have 33 turbines. We have access roads. We have collection lines. We're obligated to review this as one project by the Corps. Otherwise, it would be considered segmentation. And I, in the entirety of the project, access roads, collection lines, operations maintenance buildings, 33 turbines, there's less than a half of an acre of permanent impact for the collection of the project. So I would prefer to review it as access roads, collection lines, or turbines, but we're not allowed to segment the project out. So the numbers I cited are for the entirety of the project, so, uh, if that's helpful. Is there a card we're supposed to fill out? Y yes, there, there are cards at either that table or the front. There you go. Perfect. Here, let me walk, walk back here. <coughs> Are these transmission lines underground or above ground? Question, question was, are the transmission lines above ground or below ground? <coughs> and the, the, I'll start with tra from a transmission perspective. Transmission has to do with stepped up energy. The transmission line will essentially be from the point of interconnection substation to the directly adjacent 115. So there's, there's only one pole that will be a transmission line, and that will be above ground. It's maybe 200 feet. The collection line that you see running throughout the balance of the facility site will be underground. Um, so, then th th it all be direct berry. Yeah, can you also, when you talk about the project, this is more a general question about why actually this specific location in the mountains, not in a flatter area, what, what pro pro proposed that here? So when we're looking for a viable site uh, to have a to build a wind farm, there's you know, four or five uh, you know, things we need. To, we need ingredients. We need, right? So as we're looking at, you know, just the state of New York, we're looking at is there transmission capacity, right? We do a fatal flaw analysis for uh, trying to understand what you know, environmental features or, or species are in the area of interest. We're looking for the wind resource, right? Uh, we're looking, we're pairing that with uh, turbine technology available at that time. Um, we're looking at, you know, population density. We're looking at all of these factors to try to figure out, okay, is this a viable location? Uh, and then, you know, that's, that's the very beginning step of the process. And then starting conversations with local municipalities, landowners, and it's really an evolution of understanding of all of those key features. If they, you know, you need all of them to work to be able to have a wind farm, 
you need permits, you need land control, you need leases, uh, you need to have the wind resource that's uh, appropriate, uh, available turbine. So all of that is how, and that, evolu that evolution is what happened here as well, right? Exactly, exactly like that. Just a quick question. I don't think I need a mic to answer. I don't think too many communities jump up and raise their hand and have a new farm put in their area unless there's some benefit to the people who live in the area. This electricity that's going to be generated, where is it going? Who is that going to benefit? And is there any local benefit beyond the temporary pit you talked about, people being here for construction and maintenance? Will these folks have lower electricity bills because this wind farm is now in the town of Luther Country? Or are they not impacted at all by any of the benefits of the power of the change? Uh, sure, I'll take a, a crack at that one. So um, the contract we have in place for the Bluestone project is with uh, NYSERDA, and it's for the sale of the renewable energy credits. The energy itself will be sold on the open market, the spot market. Um, and so the way electricity works is it's going to be used closest to where it's generated. Um, will there be any specific impacts, positive or negative, to local bills? I wouldn't anticipate any any impact one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So it's really not a selling point then to have a wind farm that locally in your area on your property is just yeah. generally. It's not a selling point. Our property value is going up so right now. Yeah, well, I think in, in included in the application is a number of property value studies that have been conducted around the country. And uh, I think what you'll see in there is that impacts to local property values are very minimal. Um, and you're welcome to review that literature in, in the application it's as well. minimal unless it's you. <laughs> I know these things are down in New York City or off the coast of Long Island because the people down there don't want them. And those are the same people they buy places up here on the weekend. You think they're going to say, oh, you know what, Dave? I'll pay you for your property. I don't mind that wind turbine. How about fast are those turbine tips moving? How many hundreds of miles an hour? Can you tell me 55 BDA? You're going to compare that to birds? <coughs> Yeah, you know, just uh, I've been doing a lot of research, and uh, isn't it true that uh, on your sound impact studies that you don't consider infrasound, which is the sound below you, uh, human hearing range, um, because those are what causes a lot of the health effects that people complain about. So uh, that's my question. I apologize, I'm not a sound expert, but I do believe infrasound was included in the application. So, I, but I'm not, but our sound expert is not here, unfortunately. Uh, is there anybody else that can verify whether it was or not? Anybody here? Can you point uh, us to which piece? Yeah, the, the, the infrasound was included in Exhibit 19 and in the, the preliminary uh, noise impact assessment. I can, we can pull up the application and we can look at that if we've got a few minutes before the, okay. the 2 o'clock. Well, once they're operating, then it's a different story because you don't know what who's going to be affected there, if anybody. That's a great, no, it's a great question. So all, also in Exhibit 19, there, there's a, a post-construction <laughs> monitoring plan for noise. And there's also a complaint resolution plan specifically that addresses this concern so that if something does come up, there's an obligation to identify it, there's an obligation to address it. And the specifics of that are borne out in the, the, the noise impact assessment, the post-construction monitoring plan, and the complaint resolution plan. And, and is there any provisions to, um, if property values go down, is there any compensation for that? There, there are no provisions for that and what what Bill was alluding to earlier in exhibit 4 with respect to land use this was something that we specifically looked at uh, from uh, th there was a pretty exhaustive literature review of a range of sources on property values and what the, the common misperception is that the property values are going to go down and the literature just shows that that's not true so that that information is spelled out explicitly in exhibit 4 of the application Hold it out. Okay. Thank you. So um, the tower of the turbine, does it project down at all? One, two, did, is this part of your Speedy's review? And did you include impacts on <coughs> private wells and water table? 
I will. They, Alec, just correct me if I'm wrong with respect to the to the. I'm assuming the question is referring to the burial. The foundations are. It's not a direct embed. It's not as if the tower goes down into the ground. It'll go and connect to a foundation, and the foundation depths vary. But uh, we're talking in the 10 to 15 foot range. We're not talking um, well distance or depth. With respect to the speedies permit. The project will impact more than an acre of land and it will be subject to the Speedy's general permit for construction activities from New York State DEC. A project stormwater pollution prevention plan has been prepared and submitted with the Article 10 application demonstrating compliance with the New York State <coughs> standards for stormwater. So I think that address, so the erosion sediment control, all of that stuff has been included in the plans and included in the Article 10 application. And with respect to the last question, water wells. There was a variety of surveys done in 2018, including surveying Department of Health, Broome County, and private, so many of you probably got letters from us asking about information on wells. Um, it, it depends on where your house is in relation to different components. Um, and based on the information we got back, including uh, some of this information has been filed confidentially because it's New York State drinking water um, systems. Uh, right now, based on the, my last review of the data, no components are located within 100 feet of uh, water supplies, no projects, no components will be located within 100 feet of private wells, and there are additional provisions in place for any blasting that should occur that pre and post construction would occur for wells within, I think it was 500 feet. So there's a variety of parameters with respect to that specific, that specific question. They're in Exhibit 23 of the application, if that's helpful. Hi, my, my question is centered around the original, um, I think Wind Farm had a lot of turbines, even more in Windsor. I think at one point it was up to about 77, and then it dropped down to 40, and now I think from your presentation it was 33. Why the change? <laughs> so I can comment to that. I don't, I don't recall the 77 number, but if you go back to what I was talking about, about trying to find the, you know, the optimal location for a wind farm, we, we typically draw a bigger box, right, because we don't know as much early on, right? So we're trying to understand, you know, and that's exactly what happened here, is what's the wind resource doing in Windsor and Sanford? Um, you know, looking at the distance to the transmission line. You know, the, the, to reduce the number of turbine pads, location, and roads, we want to be have the best wind resource closest to the transmission line, which is where we ultimately will plug in, right? So we were looking initially at, we have a, a meteorological tower in Windsor <coughs> and in Sanford, and it's on Crescent Hill Road in Windsor. So that's where, that's where our, you know, initial focus was as, and knowing that we wanted to get over into uh, Sanford on Big Hollow Road, where, which is where the trans, or the point of interconnection is. And so that's where we started and then started to refine down um, because really w with that wind data we can look at what turbine is the best turbine also for the site right because they're not all there are some that are you know uh, 1.5 megawatts up to 4.8 and so we're looking at all of those factors to, to reduce the project footprint to have the maximum output so and that evolution just meant everything shifted towards uh, Sanford so can you see that this uh that this is the limit of the number of turbines that you'll be installing, or could this facility actually add more turbines in the future? Do you reserve that right? Well, I mean, I'll speak to that. Um, so Alec alluded to early, early on, one of the first things we do is look at, we study the transmission line that we're going to be interconnecting to and that all the electricity from all the uh, wind turbines are going to be going on to. This particular line we think has a maximum as it stands today of, of what uh, the current Bluestone output of 124 megawatts is without triggering significant new upgrades that would be in the tens of millions of dollars. So it's highly unlikely there'd be an expansion. And I'll just follow up that this application is for this project, right? Any other expansion or second project would go through, you know, if it was over 25 megawatts, go through the same exact process that we're involved in here today. Any project could, if they, they still have to go through the permitting process, but to Bill's point, you know, our analysis shows that there, once you get larger than this project size, you have major upgrades that could make it uneconomic. Un, un so 
other sites around the state that had many more farms didn't run into that problem? They went through the same process. They did an interjection or uh, interconnection study analysis to understand what was the appropriate size based on the capacity of the lines they're trying to interconnect. Okay. They went right, and those 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 farms are sized. You know, typically that's one of the the gating items, right? Is that the capacity in the line? So they went through the same process. The, the other projects could ex could file an application and uh, adjacent to their own project. Yes, they could. Um, since you aren't paying property tax, um, you're trying to enter into a pilot program. How much are you going to pay into the pilot program? So those uh, negotiations are ongoing. Um, we will be paying tax right, via the pilot. We will be paying a payment, the payment in lieu of, of taxes. And so that, you know, we don't have a number for you here today. Uh, that is something we've been working with the, the, the school districts and the towns on because um, there's significant you know, significant value in these projects and that's a fundamental component uh, of these projects all wind, wind farms in the state of New York have have pilot agreements so this is a public hearing shouldn't you be disclosing that type of information at a public hearing uh, there's no executed documents right we I don't have a pilot number for you today sir Bob Geiger, I'm a mechanical engineer. <clears throat> I had like three questions. What's this going to cost the taxpayers? And when you were going through your review, can I, I can't tell if I'm you're hearing me or not, are you? Okay. When you're going through your review, you said up to 100% of removing the outdated, not in use, broken equipment. You didn't up to. I didn't like up to. Could you repeat? That's the words you used. What was the? When when we're removing the equipment after it's gone oh, bad, no. or 100%. You said up to, but the, the, the documentation said different. My okay. apologies. I just spoke. just checking that. Okay, that was a scary one because I know what up to means. <laughs> Could be zero. <laughs> then the 33 turbines. How many homes will that take care of? No. No. Goes to the grid. I think in our in our application we list. 44,000 homes, but we'll, we'll double check while we're, we're looking. Uh, that for the 33 turbines, 124 megawatts. Uh, and for your taxpayer question, the, the, the taxpayer is paying for the project. The is it? for you guys to do that. Yeah. No, it's the other way around. We're going to be paying the, the pilot, right? No. No, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> How many of those seven permanent jobs will go, how many of those people will live in town? I mean, we have a dollar store for them to deposit. I don't think any of those people came from the I think they had three or four of these seven jobs. So I don't have a crystal ball to know where where folks are going to come from, but typically in a, in a wind farm, you have you know you have staff on site who have to who will go to work at the operations and maintenance building. Um, and so those people, you know, might they live in Binghamton, might they live in Deposit or Hancock, you know, they're, uh, you know, I would doubt that they live two hours away, but, you know, their job and function is going to be to you know, maintain the project and make sure it's, you know, we're meeting our warranty obligations, that it's, you know, it's, it's a safe, uh, you know, it's operating safely and efficiently. So, you know, and typically those, those folks who operate the wind farm live in the surrounding community. No, right, for on-site, on-site folks. I don't need the mic. The question is, for me to look at the map and connect the dots to single, from one side to the other, how many miles are we talking? Let me look at the scale. I think we calculated, <laughs> and we can follow up, but... Are you, are you, this is going to sound like a silly question. Are you looking for the complete run of access roads or simply from that point to that well, point? Well, from one to the first one to the last yeah, one yeah. and everything in between. How many miles of towers are we looking at? Five, ten? No, I think we're at five. Our scale is at 2,000 feet right here, right? So, you know, we can we can calculate this for you, but, five, yeah. yeah. On the bottom left to the top right. The towers are going to be relatively close. We're going to be staggered. 
Mm -hmm. They have yeah, to be. Yeah, it's hard to see on here, but it does, you know, it does show the actual carbon location. So they're, they're spread out. They're clustered in some areas, spread out in other areas. That's a good point. Yeah. We try to do that. That's not our So so we are looking for the highest highest point, right? That's that's ideal because there's higher winds aloft. And as far as maybe your spacing question, I don't, I don't know if you're interested in, uh, you know, each uh, each manufacturer has different specifications for the distance from one to the next, um, but they usually use three rotor diameters. So in, you're spacing them based on sort of based on trying to reduce any wake, uh, you know, wind wake from the adjacent turbine. So there's a whole analysis that goes on, right, about Mike, uh, about siting all of the turbines so that they're they're so most productive. Well, th there you don't want them, you know, fifteen. Let's use a rule of thumb, at thirteen or fifteen hundred feet. You're, you know, the goal, the design goal is to make sure that they're far enough apart so that they're not so waking the other, one another. So I guess the follow-up question of that is, you did the study of the the noise. It was that on one turbine. No, it's based on the array. Yeah. All of them. Kind of all the same Everything. So let me just interject. Uh, we're scheduled to start the public statement hearing at 3 p.m. Um, I'm sort of loath to interrupt the question period if you guys want to keep asking questions. Or the alternative would be to have people come up, do their statements, and then return to a Q&A if, if folks here have more questions they want to ask. Get one, more in. one more question, sir. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Carl Krantz, Town of Sanford Planning Board Chairman. Concerning the metrological towers, the initial siting application was for temporary towers. At this meeting, we're finding out that they're permanent towers. Why the difference? Correct me if I misspeak, but there, there, there are both. There are temporary and permanent meteorological towers. The temporary towers are for collecting data to help with the design in the final calibration process, and there are permanent towers to be installed during operations. And just to clarify, so the temporary towers are you know, ones that are currently up measuring data. Or you know we, or an application for a, a temporary tower that would do have the same function, right? That and those would be removed, um, you know, prior to the construction of the full project. The permanent towers are part of the facility, right? So every wind farm has permanent met towers used to calibrate um, each each turbine. So you're trying to understand that, that you're getting. Your production of your wind turbines uh, you know, should match what the wind speeds are. So that's really the function of those operational permanent MET towers. They're part of the facility. They inform you know, the availability and the operation of the, of the project. Is that helpful? Why the difference? They have two different functions. The siting was for a three-year period. And at that time, if it needed more information a reapplication was to be made correct those are temperate so and a, a separate application that start that is uh, in front of the town and the permit that was issued by the town of sanford is for the temporary towers and those are temporary the reference here was to different wholly different and in uh different locations but permanent met towers that are part of the facility they are not they are not temporary in nature and they're in different locations so they you will build the new ones. That's exactly correct. Quick question: These foundations you won't be socketing those in bedrock like with the uh, tie-ins. Aren't you going to be drilling those? So there's two different types of foundations that we're we're looking at right now. The if uh, Greg mentioned the geotechnical investigation, that really that informs us in each individual location what is the appropriate foundation. 
So the two types, the, gen the general types, and it's included in the application, are a spread footing. That would be where you, you basically dig a hole, uh, have the rebar cage in the concrete, and you take the overburden and put it back. It's a gravity-based foundation. And the other one, depending if it's a very rocky, if you're shallow to bedrock, that's going to be a rock anchor. So I think that's in lines of what you're describing. So that could be you'd have a concrete leveling pad, you would drill into the parent material, the bedrock, right, and then you'd have <laughs> threaded rods, 30 feet, you know, drilled down that are that are anchor. It's a rock anchor. So those are the two types that we're uh, looking at, and those those design general design drawings are in the application. Okay, so before I go on the record, we're just going to commence the public statement hearing portion of this proceeding. I've got 11 cards of different people who offered to come up and offer comments. Uh, we got another one here. Uh, just pass it down if you could. Um, so uh, we're going to enter the public statement hearing portion of this proceeding. We've got, uh, it looks like 13 cards now. Um, but if anybody wants to uh, fill out a card, if you change your mind and you want to offer comments at any point during the public statement hearing, you're free to do so. Um, and I'm going to explain the ground rules once they go on the record. Does anybody have any questions before I actually open the public statement hearing? Sir? Uh, I'd like to know how many of those uh, wood turbine uh, turbines are going to be on the Dewey Gecko farm? <laughs> uh, can we take that question offline and maybe do that after the public statement hearing? I, I mean, the company's here with maps. I'm sure they can answer that question. It's zero. It's zero? Okay. All right, good. Okay, thank you. So I call the order 